And good morning. I want to thank all of you for your uh, prayers and condolences this week on behalf of myself and my family. Um, it is good to have uh, brothers and sisters in Christ um, with the, the death of a family member. Um, I don't know how you do it without the hope that we have in Christ. And uh, so anyway, thank you for, for that. We are continuing in Proverbs, and we are in chapter 23 this morning. Proverbs 23, the whole chapter really kind of holds together um, on the same theme. So this is, this is kind of unusual here in, in the middle of Proverbs where we get a lot of um, jumping from one topic to another, but this one all pretty much holds together. And so we're going to look at uh, a number of these verses coupled together here as we unfold around the issue here of the temptation that we have in life as believers. to misuse good things. And I'll explain what, we, what I mean by that as we go through this. But the things that are being talked about for the most part here are not evil in and of themselves. They're not sinful in and of themselves. They serve good purposes, primarily given by God for his creation, in his creation, and for us as human beings. But what we do with them and the way that we interact with them, there is a temptation for us to use them in inappropriate ways with the results that it destroys lives. So see if you get a picture of this as we move through these verses this morning. Verses 1 through 3, chapter 23 here. When you sit down to dine with a ruler, consider carefully what is before you, and put a knife to your throat if you are a man of great appetite. Do not desire his delicacies, for it is deceptive food. When you sit down to dine with a ruler and he sets before you all of these wonderful, expensive, and tasteful delicacies before you, if you are a man of great appetite, put a knife to your throat. Restrain yourself, because there is a temptation here. And the, the way this is written, we could go in a couple of different directions, but they all end up in the same place. There is a temptation here to overindulge. There is a temptation here to take advantage of. There's a temptation here to be a glutton. And whether you're being tested here by the man of great wealth or whatever his particular purpose is, there is this temptation to overindulge in these things. And the writer of Proverbs here is cautioning the wise person to recognize this and to restrain themselves. Verses 4 and 5, Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings, like an eagle that flies toward the heavens. Money is one of the topics that's talked about almost more than anything else in Scripture, and rightfully so. This is where we get ourselves in trouble with wealth, though, when we have a wrong view of it. It says here, do not weary yourself in gaining wealth. However, Proverbs is clear that we are not to be lazy, isn't it? We are to be hard at work, but not wearying ourselves for the purpose of gaining money. This is a wrong view of wealth, a wrong view of money. This is pursuing it for the things that it cannot provide. 
because it will grow wings and fly away. That is, when we are pursuing wealth for the purpose of purpose and meaning in life, when it is our place of security, then we have moved into a wrong understanding of the purpose of wealth. We have made it something that it is not and asked it to do something that it cannot. Wealth cannot provide purpose and meaning ultimately in life. It cannot provide security ultimately in life. It will suffice for a while, but in the end, it is incapable of fulfilling those needs and those purposes. It will fly away, and we will be left with nothing. Verse 10. Do not move the ancient boundary or go into the fields of the fatherless, for their Redeemer is strong. He will plead their case against you. Apply your heart to discipline and your ears to words of knowledge. Going into someone else's land and moving the boundary markers when refers to what happened when Israel moved into the land originally. The tribes were divided up and given an area. That area was then subdivided among the tribes, among the various clans in the tribe. That land was then subdivided among the families. And boundary markers were placed to mark the land for various families and tribes and so forth. Those were not to be moved. Because if we go back and understand the culture and the law that God gave them in the Old Testament, every 50th year was the Jubilee year. The land was supposed to revert back to the original owners. If it had been sold, if it had been lent, if it had been lost for any reason during that time period, every 50 years, land was supposed to turn, return to its original owners. So even if you bought the land from someone else, you couldn't move the boundary markers because at the end of the Jubilee period, the land was supposed to revert back to the original owners. This was to prevent any of the tribes of Israel from disappearing from the land because they had this tie that God had given them specifically. So moving the ancient boundary markers was forbidden. The land, they needed to be able to mark whose land was whose throughout time. Why would you move the boundary markers? Because you were greedy. Because you were envious. Because you were coveting what someone else had and you were trying to acquire more for yourself, especially here taking advantage of those who are vulnerable or weaker for whatever circumstances had befallen them and they need to sell the land. Or they're in a position where they cannot afford to keep it anymore and you are taking advantage of them. The warning here is not to do this because they have a Redeemer who will visit righteousness upon the earth. Skip down to verse 17. Do not let your heart envy sinners, but live in the fear of the Lord always. Surely there is a future and your hope will not be cut off. Do not envy sinners. Why would you envy sinners? Well, because they have wealth or they have power or they have status or they have accumulated those things that we think we want and need and we are envious of them. Or this is the temptation at least, to be envious of those things that they have acquired and the things that they are, the wealth and power and status and so forth. But we are told not to envy them. The wise, the righteous, do not envy them. To do so results from a wrong view of sin. We have to come to an incorrect view of sin in order to be able to take us to a place where we are envious of those who are unrighteous. We don't take the commandments of God, the truth of God seriously in those cases. Verses 19 to 21, 
Listen, my son, and be wise, and direct your heart in the way. Do not be with heavy drinkers of wine or the gluttonous eaters of meat. For the heavy drinker and the glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. We are to avoid drinkers and gluttons. Why? Because uncontrolled appetites lead to destruction. Those who cannot control their appetites in any area, but here he gives the two examples in terms of alcohol and food, those who cannot control their appetites, that lack of self-control ultimately leads to destruction. Verses 26 to 28 is avoid harlots, avoid prostitutes. This takes us back to some of the first chapters where he, the father, set out to teach his son, listen to lady wisdom, not to the prostitute. The temptation is out there. The voice is calling. She goes about presenting herself beautifully and using soft and kind and seductive words to entice you in. But here he says, verse 27, the harlot is a deep pit. An adulterous woman is a narrow well. Surely she lures like a robber and in the increase in faithless among men. That is, this is a path to destruction as well. Sexual immorality, sexual sin of any kind will bring destruction to your life. Verses 29 to 35, again, talk about strong drink. Avoid strong drink. In this case, we would think in terms of alcoholism, but we could think in terms of any kinds of substance abuse nowadays. Substance abuse is destructive because it takes control of your life and enters you into a cycle where you are controlled by a substance other than yourself. And it brings and wreaks destruction. Interestingly, looking at these things, again, I began by talking about these things which can be used for good. The Bible talks about these elements in good ways in the scriptures as well. Food is a good thing. God has provided for us foods of various types that are both necessary for our health and also to be enjoyed when they are especially shared with others in a feast or a meal or a celebration. Wine is talked about as being given by God for enjoyment. Sex has been given by God as a good thing to be enjoyed by a husband and a wife in the confines in marriage. Money is a useful thing that we should work for in order to provide for ourselves, for our families. Money itself is not a bad thing. But when we have incorrect views of it, when we place it in a position to do something that it is not able to do, then it becomes problematic for us. All of these things, wealth, sex, food, drink, all of these things are good in and of themselves. They are not evil in and of themselves, but they must have their proper place. The temptation is to misuse these good things in this life in order to gratify self. In order to gratify self, that is to fill, fulfill something in myself that these things cannot fulfill. Proverbs identifies the problems in a number of different ways. It talks about those who are ignorant, the naive, and this is where Proverbs starts. You, my son, are going out into the world. You are naive. You are ignorant in the things that are out there in the world, and I need you to listen to wisdom so that when you encounter these things, you will be able 
to wisely engage with them. There are going to be those who are going to tell you that the pursuit of wealth and money is all important in life and it will solve all your problems. And I want to tell you that it will not. You need to work hard. But money is not going to bring you the security and meaning and purpose in life that they promise you it will. That is an empty promise. Sex is a good thing that God designed, but it is only designed by God to be encountered in a covenant marriage between husband and wife. Outside of that, it is destructive. Outside of that, in any form, it is destructive. It will only cause you pain and destruction in your life. Food and drink and these other things are good and necessary in and of themselves in their proper place, but they will not fill the void and the hole. It will not bring you the escape that some people try to use them for to fulfill meaning and purpose in life that can only be fulfilled by God. And so he begins the book of Proverbs by trying to bring his son and the rest of us along this journey of learning wisdom from God about these things out there in the world around us. Proverbs also talks about them in terms of laziness. Sometimes the problem is not that we are ignorant of what is going on. Sometimes we are just lazy. We are slothful. And that results in destruction as well. Proverbs also identifies the issue of being selfish. Sometimes we are too self-focused. We are interested in ourselves, what feels good, what fulfills me, what meets my needs, and we are too self-focused, too self-centered, too overall selfish. And that begins the abuse of the good things that God has provided in life to incorrectly address me and me alone. What is the solution then? Well, this chapter provides that as well. Let's go back to verse 11. No, excuse me, verse 12. Apply your heart to discipline and your ears to words of knowledge. It's a very short and simple verse, very straightforward, but very profound, and in keeping with the overall message of Proverbs. We are to listen to the words of knowledge and then apply our heart, that is our mind, to discipline. We talked recently about parents disciplining their children, and he brings that up here in verses 13 and 14, not holding back discipline from children, which is along this same line. We are to start from their infancy in teaching our children and disciplining our children in the ways of the Lord, and then we are, verse 12, to continue to do that for ourselves. Apply discipline to life. Verse 15, if your heart is wise, my heart will be glad, the father says to his son. We are to find this wisdom. Verses 22 to 24, biblical wisdom applied from father to child. What does this biblical wisdom mean? look like in terms of discipline for ourselves. Well, this is what the rest of the book of Proverbs is talking about in all of these different areas. Avoid these things, pursue these things. 
think rightly about this situation. Don't listen to the sloth. Don't listen to the lazy. Don't go the way of the wicked. Listen to the words of wisdom. All of these different proverbs are teaching us or designed to help us understand how we are to discipline ourselves in the things of God. The New Testament also picks up on this. I'm going to look at just a couple of passages in the New Testament. 1 Timothy 4, 7. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Now Paul is talking here specifically to Timothy, but it's applicable for all believers. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And I think that purpose of godliness phrase is a key element for us to think about this morning. Because we often don't stop to think about life in terms of purpose. What is the purpose of your life? And you can ask that question, we can ask that question of ourselves in the big sense of purpose. We can also ask that, that question in terms of different areas of life. What is the purpose of my life in terms of my family, in terms of my work, in my relationships, in terms of money, in terms of time? We can ask that and break that down into smaller sections as well, but here Paul is specific to Timothy. Bring discipline into your life for the purpose of becoming godly the purpose of accomplishing godliness in your life so that your behavior conforms to the image of God. Paul talks about this in Romans, being not conformed to the image of the world, to the things of the world, this is exactly what Proverbs 23 is talking about, not conformed to how the world does it, but transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we fulfill the good and perfect will of God in our lives. That takes discipline. It does not happen by accident. I've talked to too many Christians who are sitting around waiting for God to accidentally conform them into the image of Christ. It doesn't work that way. We have to be men and women. We have to be people of biblical, godly discipline if we want biblical, godly outcome. Now, is God at work doing that? Yes. But we must be at work as well. Hebrews 12, verse 1 says, in the midst of what Paul, or what, not Paul, the midst of the writer of Hebrews, excuse me, is saying, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race set before us, fixing our eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He begins with, The first part. What do you do if you want to run a race? You unencumber yourself of everything that is going to slow you down. We don't watch the Olympics and see them putting on combat boots and backpacks and trench coats to run the race. They strip down everything. I think they've gone a little bit too far, some of them. But they strip down of anything and everything that is going to encumber them or slow them down. And Paul uses that analogy for us spiritually. Unencumber yourself of anything that is going to hinder you, especially laying aside the sin which tangles us up, so that we can run the race. What race is he talking about? The race of following Christ. The race of living in godly discipline.
We need to unencumber ourselves. This is, again, what Proverbs 23 is talking about. These good things that are out there, we're usually pretty good at identifying the sinful things. Okay, obviously this is sinful and bad, avoid that, but even the good things that are out there can become sinful, as Proverbs 23 is telling us. When money becomes our place of security and purpose, it becomes an encumbrance to us. When our own appetites make us selfish, that becomes a sinful encumbrance to us. When we are trying to numb ourselves with entertainment or substances that take our mind off of life itself, those things become sinful encumbrances. Laying those things aside, identifying them and setting them aside so that we can run with endurance. It's not a word I like. Because the Christian life of following Christ is not a hundred yard dash, it's a lifelong marathon. It's day after day after day after day. It's get up again and do it again. It's an endurance race. And this is why we see Christians who look like shooting stars, like meteors flying across the sky. They're really bright, and then they flame out and disappear. It's great to really be on fire, and you can sustain that for a short period of time, but the call to follow Christ is a marathon. Day after day after day. That requires discipline. It requires self-discipline in these areas. Run with endurance, the race set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. That is a key element to being successful in this race. Fixing our eyes on him. Who he is, what he has done, what he continues to do, finding our hope and security and rest in him is absolutely vital. Because if we put our eyes somewhere else, we will not be successful in following him. In 2 Corinthians 9, Paul talks about himself using these athletic metaphors again. Run in such a way as to win. He talks about everyone who competes in the Olympics kinds of games. Everyone who competes exercises self-control in all things. Everyone who competes at that level exercises self-control in all things. I don't know if you've had much contact with professional athletes or elite athletes. They are people of self-control in big ways in their lives if they are going to be and endure as professional athletes to compete on that level. Now, obviously some of them do not exercise self-control in all areas of their lives. But we tend to think that these people have massive amounts of talent that just make them able to do the things that they do. Not true. They do have some genetic ability. They do have some talent. They have massive amounts of dedicated, disciplined, hard work to compete at the level that they do. The Christian life is no different. If we are going to be followers of Christ, it is going to require massive amounts of self-discipline in all things, self-control in all things. We must be about 
developing those types of spiritual disciplines in our lives that will allow us to run unencumbered, to set aside the sin, to identify it and set it aside, to put the good things of life in their proper places and run with endurance after Christ. Let me talk about five areas that we can think about in terms of what this would mean for us. I've mentioned them a little bit already, but let's, let me just summarize them again as we bring this to a close. First is the area of purpose. What is my purpose? Do I have a biblical understanding of my purpose in life in general And then I can break that down into areas of life as well. In my marriage, in my family, in my job, in my relationships. What is my biblical purpose? What has God called me to be in these places, in these relationships, in these areas in life? Because if I'm just wandering around ignorant to the answer to those kinds of questions, I'm going to have difficulty understanding what God is trying to do. I'm going to have difficulty following him if I don't know what the purpose is. The second is in our minds. What is it that I think about? What is it that I think about? What occupies my thoughts? Or how do I talk to myself? What conversations do I have in my head? What lies have I believed? And if you think that's an odd question, you're not asking it well enough. We all believe lies. Lies of the world, lies that we tell ourselves, lies of the enemy about who we are, about who God is, about what the purpose of life is, about why this, that, or the other is happening. What lies have I believed? What do I fill my mind with? What am I watching? What am I listening to? What occupies my time? And then how then do I take those thoughts captive to the truth of the Word of God. That takes discipline because I have to know what the Word of God says. Third area, time. How do I spend my time? What are my habits? Have I thought biblically about how I spend my time, what habits I have allowed to develop in my life. Four, relationships. Who do I spend time with? I've had conversations with lots of people over the years who have said, you know what we really need to do? We really need to return to the early church, the Acts chapter 2 church. That would make everything better. That's what we should strive to do. And I always want to take them to Acts chapter 2 and say, okay, let's read this and you tell me if you're willing and ready to do this. Those who had received the word were baptized, and there were added about 3,000 souls. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. That sound good? And everybody usually stops right there. Sounds great. Let's do that. Everyone kept feeling a great sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. 
And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Sound good still? Okay, well now wait a minute. You want me to share all of my stuff with everybody else as they have need? This isn't socialism. This is taking care of the needs of the body. Well, okay, let's not go overboard. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Did you catch that? What were they doing? Together, sharing meals, gathering together for worship, day by day. This was a common thing that they were doing all of the time. Okay, well maybe we like our once a week church approach rather than Who are we spending time with? Number five, money. How do I think about money, and what do I do with my money? Do I have a biblical view of money? Is it my money? Is it God's money? Does he care what I do with the money? How do I think about it? Am I constantly complaining that there's not enough? Am I envious of those who have more? Do I have so much I'm not sure what to do with it all? Have I even thought about how to honor God with my money? We need to be asking good questions so that we can develop biblical thinking so that we can begin to develop biblical discipline in all of these areas. Not just identifying the bad, evil things of the world, but even the good things that we misuse, that we are tempted to misuse. We need to apply biblical discipline to those areas as well. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Let me pray for us this morning. Father, we thank you for the opportunity again to open your word and be confronted with truth that is relevant to where we are in each and every day. Truth that is sometimes uncomfortable. Truth that confronts us sometimes even in our own selfishness. So we pray that you would continue to guide and direct your spirit to be at work in us, to bring about godliness, that we might be at work developing self-discipline, godly habits, running the race with endurance that we might finish well. Going beyond just superficial activities and taking up our cross to follow you. Asking difficult questions of ourselves. We pray that you might be at work in us. 
to will and to work for your good pleasure. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.